Chapter 7 The day before Christmas, the little calcettes could talk about nothing but the house on wheels which they expected Father Christmas to bring them. Even the gypsy children were excited about it. Then you'll surely come to Provence with us in the spring, tempted Tinka. Petro's car can pull your house. We'll all make the pilgrimage to the shrine of St. Sarah. Who is St. Sarah? asked Susie. I never heard of her. Tinka was amazed. If you went to school, she said, I should think you would have learned more. Don't you know that after the crucifixion, St. Mary Jacob and St. Mary Salome were seized by the enemies of Christ and set adrift in a boat without any rudder or sails? And of course, St. Sarah was with them because she was their handmaiden. The wind blew their boat to the shores of Provence. So now there's a church there and St. Sarah's statue is in the crypt. The gypsies make a pilgrimage there, pilgrimage there in May because St. Sarah was a gypsy. I want to see St. Sarah, said Evelyn. I want to see the Mediterranean Sea, said Paul. I would like to see all of those things too, said Susie wistfully. But we'll have to finish our school first. We can go we can't go to school until we get a home, Paul reminded her. Remember what Mama said? But we'll have a home when school starts, said Susie. Father Christmas is going to bring our house tonight. Armand groaned. Oh, if only he could get them off the house idea. How would you like to go to a Christmas Eve party tonight, he asked. A big party with food and singing and hundreds of people. As he expected, the Calcettes immediately forgot their house on wheels. Where, asked Paul, in a big palace? Not exactly, replied Armand. It's to be held under the Tornell Bridge. Paul's face fell. But it will be a grand party, I can promise you, went on Armand. The Notre Dame church people give it every Christmas Eve for all the hobos of Paris and their ladies. They'll sing carols and eat sauerkraut and wieners. Paul was happy again. I like to eat, he said, and I like to eat sauerkraut and wieners best of all. Maybe Mama won't let us go. She can go too, said Armand. After all, it's for homeless people, so that makes her a distinguished guest. Can the gypsies go too, asked Susie. I'd like to take Tinka. But the gypsies said they had their own plans for Christmas Eve. Tinka only grinned and acted secretive when she was questioned about it. Strangely enough, Madame Calcette agreed to go to the holiday party under the bridge. I can do so little for the children this year, she said, and they have some crazy idea that Father Christmas is going to bring them a gypsy van. Perhaps the party will make them forget. But even though the gypsies refused to go to the party, Nicky offered to drive them there in his rattletrap car. I've got some business in the Jardin de Plants Park and have to take the car out anyway, he explained. The calcettes were thrilled. They had never ridden in an automobile. They clung tightly to the seats. Jojo sat erect as if he were quite used to it. Nicky raced down the narrow streets and shouted insults at pedestrians and cars that got in his way. His own car sputtered, rattled, and clanked as if it would fall apart at any moment. But it didn't. It was a cold, clear night, and all the monuments were floodlighted. The streetlights threw golden ribbons across the Seine. The old car rattled across the Tornell Bridge and then stopped at the curb. The cow sets jumped out quickly. Armand stiffly backed out. Jojo made it in one leap. From the head of the steps, they could look down on the party. As Armand had predicted, it was crowded. A large tent had been raised on the quay. A tent that would have delighted the gypsies. Young boys and girls of the parish were carrying out pans of steaming food from the tent. The warm smell of sauerkraut was overpowering. It delighted Paul most of all. Let's hurry down before they eat it all up, he urged. But Susie's eyes were looking across the river to the little isle of the Cité where Notre Dame was illuminated like a saint's dream. Its, fine, its flying buttresses and tall, fragile arrow were frosted with light. Isn't it beautiful, sighed Susie. It looks like it was made in a bakery shop, doesn't it? But Madame Calcette had turned around to look up at the fashionable restaurant rising over the bridge, a man-made cliff honeycombed with lights. There are rich people in beautiful clothes sitting at white tables up there, she said enviously. And paying a lot of money for rich food that's going to give them indigestion, said Armand. Come on, that sauerkraut smells like a feast to me. When they reached the bottom of the steps, 
they could see that the tunnel was even more crowded than the quay. Canvas had been stretched across the far end of, to cut off the draft. There were colored ribbons fastened to it. A decorated tree stood on a high stage made of boards. Charcoal heaters had been set around to warm the air, and many of the ragged guests were huddling over them. Others sat on the curb greedily eating out of tin bowls, and some lady hobos were sitting with their backs against the bridge talking about politics and trash cans and, chill and chillblains. But most of the hobos only stood around waiting for something to happen. Armand cornered a young girl carrying some tin bowls. Right here, he said. This is where we said we'd be waiting for you. He made room for the calcettes to sit along the curb, but Madame Calcette remained standing. I'll help you carry out the food, she offered the girl. I'm not really a tramp. Besides sauerkraut and wieners, there was soup, pork, cheese, and oranges. Armand ate until he felt as if he would burst. They took turns feeding tidbits to Jojo. Have to store up like the camel for next Christmas Eve, Armand told the children. They needed no urging. But Susie kept asking, when are we going back? Don't you like the party, asked Armand. Look, there's a man on the stage who's going to play the accordion so we can all sing carols. You don't want to go now, do you? Not really, said Susie. It's just that I can't wait to see if Father Christmas brought us that gypsy house. Armand stopped gnawing on a wiener. There it was again. Now the nestlings would go back to the courtyard, only to be bitterly disappointed. He couldn't bear the thought of spoiling this wonderful night with its free food and entertainment. He lowered his voice. Listen, he said to the children, Father Christmas made me promise not to tell this, but there isn't going to be any house on wheels for you. Too many gypsy children asked for them this year, so he didn't have any left over. No home for us, asked Susie in a quivering voice. The flickering light from the charcoal burner made the tears in her eyes sparkle like diamonds. You, you mean he's not going to give us any kind of house? I don't mean that at all, parried Armand. Oh, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but the truth of it is he's having a house built for you out in Newley, and it isn't finished yet. You don't build a house during a few Christmas holidays, you know. It takes some time. They haven't even got the plumbing in yet. Susie's eyes sh shone brighter than diamonds. A real house? She asked in a hushed voice. A house growing out of the ground? Armand nodded. But not a word to your mama, he said. Remember that. I shouldn't even have told you. I gave Father Christmas my solemn promise that I would keep it a secret. But the children were kept too busy to tell their mother and Madame Calcette was kept quite busy herself because more hobos had come to the party than had been expected. But it is easy, it is easy to stretch sauerkraut and wieners. Then the crowd of hobos and their ladies and friends sang Christmas carols to the accordion music. Most of their voices were cracked and off-key, but they sounded beautiful to themselves. Armand was ready to go by midnight. He clung to the big carton that had been given him at the tent as a gift. He knew it was full of jam, fruit, and cigarettes. It would be his Christmas present to the gypsies. But Madame Calcette wouldn't think of going straight back. We must go to the midnight mass on the quay, she said. The girl told me all about it. An altar had been set up on the Tournelle Quay, right out in the open. The priest in his bright vestments, followed by his altar boys, had just approached the altar by the time Armand and the Calcettes arrived. Many of the hobos stayed for the mass. Evelyn fell asleep in her mother's arms. Jojo was quiet and respectful, although it was his first time he had ever been to church. Armand swayed from one foot to the other uneasily. It had been so long since he had, since he had gone to mass. Luckily, this one was out here on the quay. They would never have, they never would have pulled him into one of those great fancy churches. The hobo had other things to make him uneasy. The plight of this family, just how had he gotten himself so tied up with them? How had he blundered into such a trap? It was the way those starlings had begged him to stay with them. That is how they had stolen his heart. No one had ever made him feel needed before. And now he'd lied to them. There wasn't any house growing out of the ground, not for them. In his misery, he raised his eyes high over the altar, up to the stars in the Paris sky. 
Please, God, he said, moving his lips soundlessly. I've forgotten how to pray. All I know now is how to beg. So I'm begging you to find a roof for this homeless family. Then he was ashamed to notice that he was holding his beret up in his usual begging way. He quickly pulled it over his head. When they got back to the camp in the early morning hours, they found all the gypsies awake, even Petro. They soon learned why. Look, cried Tinka with delight. She pointed to a beautiful evergreen tree in front of the gypsy house. Merry Christmas, she cried. The tree was an unusual gray green with needles as soft as feathers. Fastened to its graceful branches were little packages tied in red, white, and blue papers that looked as if they might have been picked up from near, picked up near the hails. On top of the tree hung a copper star, like the patch the gypsies used for mending pots and pans. I bet that tree is the freshest, prettiest one in Paris, boasted Nicky. I cut it down in the Jardin de Plantes only a few hours ago, and the sign near it said it is a very rare tree from India. The gypsy children tore the little packages off the tree and gave them to the calcettes. They held nuts, candies, and small celluloid toys. We like to give presents. Perhaps that's because one of the wise men who brought gifts to the Christ child was a gypsy. I never heard that before, said Susie. Tinka looked at her with chagrin. What did you learn in your school besides those letters, she asked. But before Susie could answer, Armand was presenting his carton of goodies to the gypsies. He generously added that it was from the Calcettes, too. But the biggest surprise was for him. Madame Calcette brought out a small package neatly wrapped in newspaper. A fragrant smell hovered around the gift. He opened it to find a glossy pink bar of soap. He looked at it for a long time. He sniffed it thoughtfully. Just what I needed, he politely thanked her.